Hey everybody, um, thank you for being here for our uh, fourth student to student series session with Fiveable. It's called Studying for Tests. And today, Skylar and I will be talking about how to study for tests in the AP World History Modern Curriculum. Uh, now, we are waiting for Skylar to reconnect back into this session, but uh, in the meanwhile, I would like y'all to all answer the polls that I've put out there. One about is this your first stream with Fiveable? Here, and she is good to go now. Um, so I'll invite her up. All right, so answer the polls with relation to your uh, first stream with Fiveable and also your unit test. How do you feel about them? Can you guys hear me? Or no? Yeah, let us know if you can hear us or see us, all right, in the comment section. All right, so we did get the poll recipients and um, three people said it wasn't their first stream. So welcome to all of you who are uh, new to Fiveable. We're a great platform. We'll explain all of that to you in a few slides. Um, and one person said it was their first stream. Uh, so that's great. Also two votes for super hard about unit tests in AP World History and Modern. Um, that's how I felt last year. I'm on the same boat with you guys, but you know, uh, we learned, we lived the experience. So we're here to talk about it and how to help you guys uh, in the curriculum. So without further ado, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, so, first of all, I'm Varun Karathala. I'm on the World History AP Modern uh, stream team here at Fiveable. Um, I'm a lifelong learner. I love world history. I love social studies. I love learning about um, different things in world history. Um, I'm a sophomore from high school uh, from Georgia, and I took the AP World History course last year as a freshman in high school, and I scored a 5 on the 2019 AP World History exam, a 790 out of 800 on the 2019 SAT subject test, in world history. So I'm very, very excited to be able to talk to you guys about studying for tests because, you know, I've took a lot of these tests and I've scored well on these tests, as has Skylar. Uh, so without further ado, let's you know, introduce her. Okay, what's up? I'm Skylar. Um, I'm a sophomore, but I'm from New Jersey. Um, you know, I'm the history buff. I self-studied AP World last year, um, accidentally, but that's, that's another story. Um, I got a five on the AP World exam, um, and on December 7th, I'm going to be taking the SAT for World History, and hopefully I can do as well as Bruno on that. All right, so some of our next, well, the next thing we're going to review is, first of all, what is Fiveable? Uh, so Fiveable, we like to compare Fiveable to Twitch, and if you guys know, Twitch is a platform from which gamers can connect to their viewers, um, and Fiveable is very, very similar. We connect students to teachers from across the nation and students to students, so we have boundless interactivity. You know, you can see how many actions, uh, how many things you can do on this stream, and we just allow for an emulated classroom setting that can really provide a complement to your in-class learning. So um, if you're learning stuff in class from lectures and things like that, we're a great, great, great place to get some extra learning, get that edge over your peers, and that's what we're really here for, to give you guys a good understanding of AP World History concept, of concepts for any AP subject, um, to prepare you for that exam come May. Okay, so what are we going to talk about in this stream? Um, so we're going to start off with some background about test taking, um, and that's basically just why is testing important, and how can I how can I use my test taking to, to help me out as much as possible as time goes on? Um, and then we're going to go through the four steps of taking and preparing for uh, a test in class. Um, and then we're going to have some in-class tips. Uh, and then we're going to have a practice question. So we have a, some practice uh, multiple choice and a practice short answer. Um, and then we're going to have our student study session. Um, so that's basically just a Q&A period. If you have questions from class, if you want some advice, we're here to help you guys out. For sure. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be reviewing, as Skylar just said, um, some background about testing in any school, testing on AP examinations, and just testing in general. Um, so classroom-based testing is something that high schools across the nation do, um, and it's not something that you're, you know, not in the same boat with other people. It you know, with. Um, and testing kind of helps teachers determine kind of weak points for students so that we can really, teachers can, um, you know, make their learning specialized towards their students and make it much more informative and beneficial. And you guys already know this, but AP type questions often appear on unit exams for AP world history. So, you know, using these subject tests, these unit tests as a way to kind of gauge your understanding and gauge your understanding of AP type questions is really, really beneficial because they're made by AP teachers who know the content material and how the AP exam questions are structured. And then also testing um, allows students like myself to gauge and reconstruct their understanding of common historical concepts. So what I would recommend is after every single test you take to go back and look at what you missed and where this content from because that's what I did for every single test last year. You know, when I missed questions, I looked at it and I was like, 
Where does this content emanate from? How can I learn this content better so that I can't miss these same questions on the AP examination come May? And that's just a great, great concept to help you all out. It also help forces us as students to kind of commit to more learning. So when you're taking these tests, you know, take them seriously because they help you out in the long run. Um, and there's also something called a testing effect psychologically that can help all of you in just retaining the information much better if you take a test. And that's why I would just recommend don't slack off when it comes to tests and take them very, very seriously because it can help you guys out um, come May on the AP examination. I can't stress that enough. Um, but also testing is often perceived as something that's insurmountable, a very difficult task. But the problem is not just the, how hard the test is, as you guys mentioned, it's often how hard we as students uh, perceive how to study for these tests. And that's what the focus of our session here today will be. It's how to prepare for these tests and just time saving methods to get you guys the same scores with less preparation time and more spaced preparation time. So if you guys are with us this entire time, you'll, you'll learn a lot of helpful strategies to kind of help you guys out in preparing for these exams and putting in less effort to get a more uh, beneficial result. Yeah, okay. Um, so now we're going to go into the steps. And the first step is to create a timetable. Um, so I, I got to work on this myself. But ideally, you want to begin studying for a test about a week before, before you have the test. Um, so that way you can distribute your study times among the whole week. Um, and on the right side here, we actually have an example of a timetable. This is supposing that you know you have a test on a Monday, and then you can distribute the times throughout the week. Um, and one of the most helpful study techniques is called the Pomodoro method. And basically, it's where you distribute your practice time and your rest time to ensure you know maximum understanding of material. And basically, how it works, you have 25 minutes of work and then five minutes of rest, and that sort of repeats itself. Um, and if your teacher is not, you know, if he doesn't tell you the day when you have your test, you need to ask because I have that his I have that problem in my U.S. history class. Um, and just a little tip that I have is that if you can, if you have like a 10 minute free time every day, you want to utilize that for studying. Um, so for me last year, I would always do it on the bus ride to school. That's when I would study. Um, and in winter, I would always study right before basketball practice. Um, so if you can create a routine out of reviewing your notes, that's going to be really helpful for the test. All right, so the next step that we have here is compiling your resources. And after creating a timetable, as Skylar just mentioned, you'll need some workable and effective resources to use while studying because you can't just you know, use nothing. Uh, you want to have a good mix of different third-party resources and in-class materials to use to help you achieve success. Um, so it's often optimal, as I said, to use third-party resources, as we've listed here on the right, to complement one another and provide a more clear unit breakdown. Um, and it's also very beneficial to use a mix of visual, auditory, and semantic cues. So what I mean by this is that if you want to use some sources that visually lay out information like animations, like pictures and things like that, but you also do want to use auditory sources like videos where people are talking to you about different concepts and also semantic cues, which give you the meaning of different terms like AP World History textbook, text-based questions, text-based resources. And that's what we really want to capitalize upon when we're coming to AP World History practice tools and resources. So I've compiled a list of the best AP World History resources for 2019 for the modern course and i have listed them on the right so first of all we have textbooks and the two most beneficial resources that i've uh, seen from students this year and learned last year from are the amsco in world history modern and also the barons in world history modern the premium version so i'll recommend either one of these books to help kind of supercharge your learning in the curriculum um, also, there's some great video and uh, lecture tutorials that I have learned from last year and I know students are learning from uh, that are updated for the AP World History Modern course. So first of all, I recommend Favable, obviously. Uh, so as Mr. Donald Diorto said, uh, look for the 2020 modern versions of these books because for the AMSCO and the Barron's book, you don't want to find the old version. Uh, but anyways, back to my point about video lectures. Uh, so Fiveable is a great resource for video lectures. We have a uh, unit review, we have content reviews, and it's just very informative for every single student. Um, also on YouTube, there's a couple of sources that I recommend. First of all, Steve Heimler. So there's a guy named Steve Heimler, and he's one of the greatest um, AP World History teachers, uh, I'd say, in the United States. And he does make review sessions for YouTube on, on his channel called Heimler History. And also uh, there's a resource called uh, Crash Course, which is on YouTube as well. And both Heimler's History and Crash Crash course provide great, great, great animation type tools. And then also I'd recommend freemanpedia.com. Um, it's actually freeman-pedia.com. Uh, and Freemanpedia has a lot of great resources made by a teacher to kind of help you guys in text-based learning. 
Um, and also we have Quizlet and flashcards and you can kind of make your own resources, which I would recommend putting these resources in your own words and making your own uh, study tools, which is very, very beneficial, especially to me to kind of get a grasp for the concepts at hand. So Scott, do you have any more tips that we can use? Any tools, resources? Um, I think I mentioned this in almost every stream, but I love the AMSCO textbook. Um, I use that for self-studying and it taught me so much. It really helped me to understand the material. Um, but another thing I would say is to use the ultimate guide to AP world. Um, and Dylan Black made it. He's an intern at Fiveable. I think he also does streams for uh, Mac economics and some AP world ones. Um, I'm just going to put the link in the chat. It's really helpful because it sort of goes up. It goes over everything. And we have a comment from Mackenzie. The five steps to a five study guides are useful as well. I would agree with that. That's really, it's a helpful resource. I do think they're very useful, yes. Um, but me personally, I recommend going through a NAMSCO uh, during the school year or a Barron's and then reviewing the five steps to a five guide before May because that kind of gives you a consolidated overview, whereas like Barron's and NAMSCO, in my view, uh, gives you a more detailed overview. I would say the same probably applies to the Princeton Review textbook. That one's more of a right before the test quick review sort of thing. Yeah, and nothing uh, wrong about those books. I mean, I use Princeton before the exam, but you know, Princeton is just a much more consolidated version, and I don't know how much it can help you on unit tests. All right, okay, so also, no, yeah, you're good. Um, also, when you're studying, you want to make sure that you go over the various AP World History themes and also glance at the course and exam description for studying in AP World History. So the course and exam description is published by College Board every year for the AP exam and it gives you guys some valuable tips, some valuable key concepts to learn about for all unit tests and that's kind of what your teachers base your tests off of. Also the AP History themes. Um, I'm going to link them or put them right here. So the AP History themes are as follows. Uh, humans and the environment, kind of demographic changes that occur in different locations and how it impacts the environment. Cultural development interactions, you know, how culture is transported across trans-regional lines and things like that. Governance, pretty obvious, just the governmental structures, bureaucracies, things like this, governmental thought, political thought. Um, economic systems, how monetary exchange occurs, trade, and um, such resources. And also social interactions and organization, how people interact with one another, and how people just talk to one another and spread information. And also technology and innovation. This is often apparent in every single society, and it's just so much innovation that's occurring in AP World History Modern. So I would recommend, um, as a starter point, when you're studying for any, any unit in AP World History, uh, I would recommend to look off of these themes and to kind of base your studies off of these themes. Uh, what I did last year was I kind of created a map for every single unit, and um, I would just put down how each location that we're learning about um, is impacted by these changes, these AP World History themes. Um, and also the CED has great key concepts. Um, and, you know, Mr. Beckman also said he's a teacher in AP World History, by the way, you guys. And he copy and pastes and modifies from the CED when he's writing questions. So same thing with most AP World History teachers. They usually use this. And thank you, Mr. Beckman, for linking that in the description. But yeah, you guys can definitely go to that. They have key concepts to kind of base your learning off of. And I'll recommend pasting them in a Google Doc and just going through these themes and um, analyzing them in that form, which is what I did last yeah. year. I keep a running list for me. And um, I do the same thing for my US class now. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Little said, I allow annotated CED in light of notes in my class. So yeah, I mean, teachers are loving this. It's something that teachers always use. Um, and Mr. Donald DiOrto also commented that the five, five steps to a five guide is updated for the AP world modern 2020 and has a app with computer facets. So I actually think this is very good because if you have an interactive thing that you can do for like 15 to 20 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, um, it can help you on the AP exam because it gives you that, you know, long distance review and just like that retention over long periods of time. Okay, um, so now we're going to talk about setting up the atmosphere for while you're studying. And this stuff, this is so important because it really makes sure that you have an effective study session. Um, so the first step is to remain distraction free. You know, we always have our phones buzzing, our computers, uh, you know, we're checking your text, Snapchat, whatever. Um, so it's so important to stay distraction free because you don't want to interrupt your studying time. Um, and there's actually a lot of resources that you can use to, to like make sure you're not distracted by your phone or computer. Like I know on my phone, I have, oh yeah, uh, Donald Diorto said, put phone on silent mode. That works. Um, I use this app called Flora. So basically like you can plant a tree and if you exit out of the app, so if you like go on to an, uh, like Instagram or if you go on to, like, I don't know, Facebook or something, um, then it'll kill a tree and then you, you'll have a non-effective study session basically. 
Um, and it's also an extension you can get on Chromebooks. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you shouldn't be listening to Cardi B. <laughs> um, and the next step is to get enough rest because you're really you're not going to be able to focus if you if you didn't get enough sleep. You know, you'll just be I'm so tired. I can't do this anymore. Um, and another thing is to get your heart pumping. Exercise helps you stay focused. It, it helps you gain your energy for studying. It's really helpful. And the last thing to really ensure you have a good, op, you know, a good studying environment. Um, is to eat superfoods. So these could include uh, oil, oily fish, berries, dark chocolate, nut seeds, uh, and caffeine. And they can all really help to make sure that you have an effective study session. For sure. And also um, with regards to music, I mean, I feel like it's very important for you guys to kind of distance yourself from the lyrical music because it takes your focus away from what you're studying for. Um, and also what I do all the time is I listen to classical music like Mozart and things like that, which really helps me focus in and zero in on the content information. Yeah, like I personally, I love classical music. Like I'm big into 20th century classical and that just helps me focus so much. Um, does caffeine mean that I can drink three massive 100 milliliter power drinks? I think so. I think that counts. Yes. But well, I mean, I would recommend it personally because that gives you a really, really energetic kind of atmosphere and you might not be able to get some sleep that night, which is detrimental to your studying. Okay, and, and, so um, we go have, ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, we, we have some uh, statistics in here. Evan Little said that Stanford says up to three cups of black coffee is still healthy. So well, I guess we could take note of that. And um, another AP World teacher has said, but seriously, classical music gives you an edge. And I think we should just take note of that to help with studying. For sure. Um, so step four, getting to work the main basics of studying for um, a unit exam in AP World History Modern and in any AP History subject for that matter. Um, I usually break down my study sessions in a, th a three-step process um, for a week before the exam. And obviously there's other things you can do. And also I kind of label in like two day periods for what I want to review. Like, first of all, I do kind of a review and then like a resources making. And then like, as you saw in the past slide, I do a test take in kind of two days. But before I do all of that, I just have one hour where I go and review, summarize and test. And that's my three step uh, process for myself. And it may help you guys if you guys try it out. So first of all, the first thing that I do for the 60 minute um, period is 20 minutes of review of my past notes online notes and videos and other resources for you know 20 minutes or more and during this period i just review anything that i have for ap world history go through the content um just go through the processes and look at it and just like consolidate it into my brain and then for 20 minutes i summarize all the information that i've learned into bullet points a very simplistic outline that i can look off of the day before the test and night before the test and things like that and then i test my knowledge and that's one of the most important tips I can give you guys. Um, I test my knowledge for, at the end for 20 minutes to just make sure that the content is getting into my brain and to make sure that I remember this content in future times. And then I repeat this thing if I have time after, but this is usually my uh, study session. So first of all, I have a couple of insiders tips. Uh, so I would recommend creating study documents or unit-based study documents on Google Docs or another document wherein you can permanently access it uh, to give you some information to base your studies off of in May. Because uh, me and my friends, we made study documents for every single unit test in AP World History last year. And when it came time to May to study for the AP exam, um, it was very, very important for us to have that because it gave us something to back off of, to look off of the study for the exam. And it really made our study time much, much more shorter and easier. Also, I would say to engage in the vocal rehearsal of important information, and this can be done in two ways. Uh, first of all, you can go to talk to a friend and just like rehearse your information with that friend. And second of all, you can kind of go into your voice recorder on your phone and just like say all the information that you have. And I think both of these tips are very, very um, helpful because uh, for me myself, uh, you can just, I do it all the time. I just say information that I have into my phone and just like I remember the information the next day without any um support needed. So it's, it's just, I don't know how it works. It's psychological, I think, but it does help me. Also, um, make sure to utilize a wide variety of resources because I utilized so many resources last year for AP World History Modern um, and definitely include five bowl in your study sessions because we provide you with a very comprehensive, a very um, interactive way to learn the information. Yeah. And I just have a quick tip um, and that's to create like a one page cheat sheet, cheat sheet don't actually cheat um, for your tests. So like earlier this year, we were having a test in my US history class on colonies. Um, and I could not remember anything about Georgia for the life of me. 
Um, so, you know, I wrote down everything that I needed to know on this one piece of paper and I reviewed it throughout the entire day and I ended up getting all the questions on that right on the test. So by making your like one page sheet that you can look at throughout the day before the class, um, it really helps you to keep the memory fresh in your head and it's uh, beneficial. Okay, um, so here's some in-class tips to help, help, to help out with your studying. And the number one important thing to remember, this is so, so, so vital, is to be an active learner. So if you are an active learner, you are taking notes, you are raising your hand, you are asking questions, you are paying attention, you aren't playing Papa's Pizzeria. Um, okay, which is something that I have done. Um, anyway, it's it, you have to stay paying attention in the class so that you can really understand the information. Um, and just it's so important that you ask questions because there's this huge stigma that if you ask questions, you are wrong. You know, if you ask, if you ask questions, you're, you're dumb, you're not, you're not thinking. Um, but they really, they help you understand things and it makes it so much, so much better for you. Um, it's also important that you create a study group. So I did this for AP World last year. Um, and if you can explain things to other people and other people can explain things to you, and that helps you just get a better and more well-rounded uh, understanding of the information. Um, and the last thing, this is so helpful, to review your notes. Um, and if you review your notes, then you really, that's your number one resource on this test. Um, so just, it's helpful that you review your notes right before you go to bed um, so that we can like sleep on the information. Um, yeah, and then on the right side here, we actually have two methods of note taking. So there's Cornell notes and there's the outline notes. Um, so for Cornell, you'll take notes on, you know, the largest portion of the page. Um, and then on the left side, there's like this, the column where you can, you know, write questions about it or anything else, any notes you have on your notes. Um, and then on the bottom, you can do a summary. And then the Oxford learning method, you have like the main topic and a subtopic and you just keep going in that method. Yeah, and just like both these methods really help you, but me, myself, I've used the Cornell method. It's kind of uh, less used than the outlining method, but it does give you guys something to look off of. Like when you're going through your big note notebook, you can kind of look off of the left side and see, you know, this is what I did today. And also, if you need some information off the bat, you can just easily find the information. Yeah, I personally like to put post-it notes in my notes. Um, so if I have any questions, I can just go back and look at the post-it and answer it. That's also a great tool. All right, so um, we're going to move out of the overall content stream here today. Um, if you guys have any questions, please leave them in the chat bar. We'll get to them as soon as possible. But I do want to move into the practice SAQ here. So this is a practice SAQ, and I'll read the prompt here on the image here. So bend and salt cellar with Portuguese figures. Sometime in the 16th century, the 1500s, an ivory carver from Ben and along the Atlantic coast of West Africa created the salt cellar below. A salt cellar holds salt, the case in the bowl on top of the Portuguese figures, and is used at a dining table. So that is the figure that we can see here. Um, if you guys have anything to look at, like, can you guys look at this and tell us what you see off the bat? Look at the prompt, anything that strikes out to you. It's a very, um, you know, a tested image. We've seen it a lot. So if you guys want to, you know, write stuff down about it, tell us in the chat section. Anything? Wait a few more minutes here. And you know, don't feel afraid to interact in this. As I said before, as both of us said, being an active learner is very important. And like, if you guys don't interact, it's often detrimental to learning. All right, so if nobody's anything to add, the first thing that I see um, is that it says Portuguese. Well, it doesn't say Portuguese. Yeah, it says Portuguese figures on it. So under this salt bowl are Portuguese figures. And that really strikes out to me because it's Ben. It's the West African coast. And it's indicated there's some kind of relation um, and transfusion be between Portugal and the West African coast. Also, it says a salt cellar, which means that there's a lot of salt available at this time. And especially based on my prior knowledge, West Africa didn't have a lot of salt. So that may have been stuff that was transported from elsewhere um, into uh, West Africa at this time period. Anything else to add, Skylar? Um, I think that's about good. Yeah. All right. So the first SAQ prompt that we have here is identify one major historical factor that contributed to the creation of the salt cellar. So if you guys can answer this question in a very, very concise format, really quick here, um, we'll get to it. 
All right, so McKinsey goes off the bat and says, uh, Molly actually was a hub of gold and salt trade. So yes, that's very true. Molly was a hub of gold and salt trade because that's exactly what was happening. Uh, the gold dust was being transported from Molly to the European nations, and then they were transporting it for salt, pretty much. That was the exchange that was going on. Anything else, you guys? All right, so that's right on. Um, one of the major historical factors that contributed to the creation of the salt cellar was that big trade going on between West Africa, between Mali, between Benin and the European entities, because it was a great salt and gold trade. Basically, they traded metals uh, for salt, and you know the Africans wanted salt because they didn't have them in West Africa. They traded them with North Africans and the Europeans um, for gold, which they transported upwards. So that contributed to the creation of this salt cellar because it, you know led to major transfusion of culture um, and things like that. And uh, Mr. Donald DiOrto said, likewise, the Songhai Empire and the Mor Moroccans, the Spanish and Portuguese who took over the Songhai, um, that's true. That's very true. They took them over uh, later on. But it's a lot of transfusion going on before this. So B, explain one specific historical effect of the interactions that led to the creation of the figure depicted above. So please answer this question in the chat room. Uh, we'll discuss it once you guys answer. So again, if y'all are just joining us, um, answer this, this question B, explain one specific historical effect of the interactions that led to the creation of the figure depicted above. And Evan Little just said sales and sales. Um, very, very true. We'll discuss why in a few minutes here. And Mr. Beckman said, think about the Portuguese element. Very true as well. Anything else you asked to add? All right. So going back to the ideas of, of a sales and sales. So the major reason why he said sales, you guys, was because when we're going from Mali and these, um, the Benin and all these places of Islamic influence, there was a lot of um, advanced maritime technologies because the Islamic people had very advanced uh, mindsets with regard to maritime technologies. And the Portuguese came down here and they looked at it and they had very, very, you know, different ideas. And they took these ideas and they used them to increase their shipbuilding, increase their, uh, how they made sales to make their maps better and to make the way that they process through these, um, these, these, these winds in, you know, around the coast, much, much more efficient because the way that they did this maritime technology has really helped the Europeans out, especially the Portuguese. And also why he said sales was one of the major historical effects, as we mentioned in the last uh, bullet point was that there's a lot of trade going on between Portugal and European entities and places like Benin and Mali on the western coast of Africa, and especially expanded over later years to include the slave trade, because once we discovered the new world, there was a heavy slave trade, a heavy need for slaves later on, and that was one of the major effects of this interaction. So the next question, C, explain one additional contributing factor to uh, or historical effect of the interactions that produce the figure above. So it's a either or question. Do you either get to describe an additional contributing factor or a historical effect uh, that produced the figure? So definitely, you know, answer in the comment section. We'll see what transpires. All right, so if you don't have anything, I'll go ahead and say uh, one of the major contributing factors uh, to this expeditions, the Portuguese expeditions and contacts into Africa was, as you said before, Mackenzie, uh, first of all, it was, you know, the gold and they wanted this gold. They wanted uh, this mutual trade relations, but they also wanted to spread Christianity. And if you do remember, the Portuguese are Catholic Christian and the Catholics are very, very zealous about their own religion. They want to spread this religion to their best abilities. So that was a major one of the other major contributing factors to uh, these expeditions and this trade 
uh, between the Europeans and West Africa. And another historical effect of the interactions that produced the figure above was the Portuguese really made a lot of money. And that's because they were able to kind of act as intermediaries in this trade and trade much, much more resources. But also you got to remember, if you didn't mention this before in prompt B, slavery, because the major effect is that the Portuguese come down in later years and start trading slaves with the West African entities and using them to kind of fuel their wealth in future years. Um, so D, uh, explain one change in the relationship between Europeans and West Africans in the centuries following the production of these salt cellars. So answer this question in your own words in the chat room and we'll discuss it once you guys are done with that. And I encourage you to please, please, please comment anything. Um, if you guys are wrong, it's totally fine. I mean, we're reviewing this thing for the first time here. So try your best, y'all. Again, don't feel afraid to answer these questions. We're here to help and really help you guys if you guys try to answer these questions. You know, get out of the way. And then we have a question from Eric Beckman. Um, what happened when the Portuguese began trading with West Africa? And I feel like that question can help you guide can help guide you guys in your answers. For sure. All right, so basing off that question, what happened when the Portuguese began trading with West Africa? You can answer prompt D and actually any of these prompts for that matter, because what happened when they started trading was the Europeans had much, much more direct contacts into Africa. And this led to a, a colonization effort because they discovered mass slave slaves in Africa and they can get these slaves and things like that, and mass labor resources. So what happened in these centuries following the production of the salt cellar was there was much more direct interaction between the Europeans and the African entities because the Europeans kind of figured out that, you know, we can capitalize upon this and make a lot of money off the slave trade. So it sparked something called the Berlin Conference, which we'll learn about in the next period um, by Otto von Bismarck from Germany. And he kind of organized a coalition without any African rep representation, uh, to what I can remember, that kind of distributed the entire African continent between the European entities. And they all came in and colonized every single region. Um, I think Liberia, Ethiopia were left untouched, but other than that, the entire continent was kind of taken over by Euro the Europeans. And it was much different than this kind of trade and this mutual benefit. It was the Europeans just coming in and taking everything, y'all. It was like a big colonization effort, kind of like what the British did in many parts of the world. But that's what happened. It was much, much more direct after this period, after 1600, when we go into the 17th century. All right, so next we have a multiple choice questions. I'll let Scott yeah, take it away. So I'm just going to walk us through it. Um, and here on the left side, we can see the, I'll just read it out loud. Um, illustration of the first battle of Panapat in 1526 in the Babornama, the autobiography of Babur. Uh, and his victory at Panapat led directly to his establishment of the Mughal Empire in Delhi. This illustration appears in a manuscript of the Babur Nama prepared for his grandson, Emperor Akbar, long after Babur's death. As you can all see, I butchered every word in that. Um, but we're just going to take a second and really just pull apart this picture first. Um, so we know that this is a battle. And if we look closely, we can see that they have three cannons on the left side of it. Um, so that's probably going to be important to our answer. Um, and then we can see that there's some people in cavalry. Um, they have swords in some parts. Um, so that's just some pictures, some things we can take for the picture. Also um, the cannons there. We can see yeah. a bunch of cannons that are leaning towards the people. The oh, and we have a comment, gunpowder empires, exactly. So that's very important to this. Um, so the first question is, which of the following details in the image above was most significant to the power of the Mughal Empire? Um, so just leave your answer in the, in the chat, A, B, C, or D. And also great answer, Mackenzie. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, that was a major effect because once they found the new world, they had a newfound need for the African continent. And that's what fueled all this colonization. And that's a great answer because that's exactly what we need. Yeah. And you can leave your answer for this in the chat if you want. Yeah, and like Mr. Diorto just said, uh, no one's grading you here. You know, we're just practicing with friends and we're just trying to help you guys out in the best way possible. So don't feel afraid to, to answer these questions because, I mean, it's only to help you guys. I'll give you like 15 more seconds for this one. 
um, and then we can just sort of walk through it. Okay, um, well, the answer to this one would be A, artillery. And we can actually figure that out just by thinking about the Mughal Empire. We don't really need the picture. Um, so the Mughal Empire was one of the three major gunpowder empires. Um, so they really formed their economy and their, you know, their identity was based off this gunpowder trade. Um, so knowing that, we can assume that it's artillery because that's the only one here that really, oh yeah. Um, and we have Melissa Longnecker said artillery equals cannons if the vocabulary was tricky here. Um, so yeah, they really, they developed their trade off of these gunpowder. Um, they developed their conquering over gunpowder. So that's why it would be A. Um, and the second question is, which of the following expresses most likely purpose of this illustration? Um, so, you know, leave your answers in the chat. Ten more seconds, I think. Okay. Um, so let's just go. Oh, okay. That that is it. <laughs> that's a helpful. That's a very helpful way to put it. Okay. Um, so for this one, we can see. Okay. So we have Mackenzie said B. Um, so this one's a, this is a tricky question, um, but we can start off first by just by what's it called um, by eliminating uh, answer C. And answer C says to memorialize the Sultan of Delhi. But here's the thing: the Mughals were the people that overthrew the Sultanate of Delhi, um, so it's not going to be C. And we also can assume that it's probably not going to be D, um, just because this isn't really. It's it's artistic, but it's not really just showing off artistic expression. So that leaves us with A or B. Um, now, here's where the thinking gets a little rough. Um, so the options are either a realistic record of the battle or to legitimize Mughal rule. And for here, we're going to have to go back to the context of the image. Um, and it says that it is in the autobiography of Babur. So that sort of implies that he is, um, that, you know, he's trying to glorify the battle to show that he's better than he is. Um, so that could show bias. So I think that A would probably be the correct answer here. Yeah, it's also prepared for his grandson, Emperor Akbar, um, mm -hmm. long after his dad. So it's obviously something that wants to glorify them rather than make it too realistic. And then uh, part C says, which of the following aspects of the Mughal Empire differed from the, con oh gosh, I can't, I'm going to try to say this, uh, contemporaneous Ottoman Empire. That was quite a fun word to say. <laughs> I'll give you like 20 seconds for this one. And Evan Little said C. Melissa Longnecker said C. We have another three C's in the chat. Okay, well, uh, you're all at the same conclusion that I came to, and that is C. Oh, yeah. Um, so, and we asked, some, someone asked, could you define contemporaneous? I think, okay. Um, well, contemporaneous means that two things are existing at the same time. Um, so in this case, it would be the Ottomans and the Mughal Empire existing at the same time. Um, so let's just think this through. Um, we start off, answer A says founded by Turkic nomads. Well, that's correct, because both of them are these, you know, gunpowder empires. They're all descended from Turkic nomads. Um, and then we have part D says the most powerful state in its region. And that means, well, both these people, they, both these groups, they governed over large regions of their, of their area. So that means that they would still be the most powerful state. So that means that we're left with B and C. Um, so the answer for this one would be C, as we all decided. Um, and that's because of the Hindu subjects. And really the only people that were ruling over Hindu subjects at this time were the Mughals, because I was in um, India, which is where Hinduism mainly resides. Um, so the answer to that one C. Nice job. And it could have fooled you because the Ottomans were very culturally inclusive, but you do yeah. have to remember that the Hindus were mainly based in India. And also, just a point to add, uh, Babur was a Turkic nomad. He actually descended from the Mongols, and he just converted to Islam, and that's how he started the empire. Just a little point to add. All right. 
Uh, so to end this session, here's our main meat of the stream, our uh, student student series open ended Q&A. So ask us any questions you guys have about uh, studying for tests, uh, just preparing for the AP exam, life in general. You can ask us about different study skills, different units in AP world history. Um, it's just a really open session where we can help you guys um, with anything. So feel free to ask away. Okay, um, so we have a question from Evan Little. It says, I study real hard, but I am always thrown by the stimulus and a stimulus question. What can I do? Okay, um, so basically what you have to do then is practice your stimulus, your, like you know, how you, an, an, I can't talk, analyze a stimulus. Um, so that could basically be um, how do you pick up, how do you take notes on each little portion? If it's a picture, how do you notice different aspects of it? Um, if it's a, you know, a passage, how can you annotate it? So I would just advise that what you do is, um, you know, find, go on Khan Academy. They have a lot of really good stimulus-based questions um, and just keep practicing and work on your uh, annotation skills. So Mr. Diorto said, what are some multiple choice skills that can help students eliminate less than best answers in multiple choice questions. Um, so when you're reviewing multiple choice questions, I would recommend to before you even read the stimulus um, to read the you know read the questions first, and that helps you kind of eliminate some answers because you can go right off the bat and look at you know what do I know about the concept? Is there anything I can just eliminate really really quick before even reading the stimulus? And then it helps you kind of focus upon what's important in the stimulus to kind of get the most from the stimulus. Um, and also, I would recommend going off your context a lot, also using the stimulus, but going off your context, what you know about the empires at hand, um, and just think about the best answer. You know, what is the most um, reasonable answer? What is the answer that most AP readers will look at uh, as the most beneficial, the most relevant to the empire? Anything else for, from you, Skylar, for multiple choice questions? Um, I would say, well, just for uh, Don Duarte's question, um, I would say that something that can help you eliminate answers is to think of everything like periodically. Um, so sometimes if, if it's almost like set, if the question appears to be set in like period two, um, and there are answers that could, that are relevant to the, that are relevant to the region that could be an answer, but are from like period four, you can immediately get rid of those. Um, so for example, like you could be talking, the question could be about the Mali empire, but the, there are answer options that are about like colonization in the Mali empire then you know that you can eliminate those answers. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, that's something that like I used last year. I forgot about it, but definitely do that kind of stuff because it helps you eliminate answers. And also like when you're preparing for the AP exam in May, I would recommend creating like a little short list of key concepts about every single time period so that you can kind of make that differentiation and say, you know, this wasn't occurring in this period, was it? I can just eliminate that answer real quick. All right, so Muslim Longnecker says, how can I build my vocabulary on non-history words? Stuff like artillery or contemporaneous sometimes get me even when I know the content. So I'm thinking about how to, okay. Okay, um, well, I know that there's there's some resource that you can try on the internet. Like Albert IO has a list of like words that are helpful to know. Um, I'm gonna try and drop a link. And I also like when I'm studying for the SAT, there's some history passages in it. So I do go online and search up major history words that I need to know. And I think they have, they probably have some, as you said, for AP World History Modern um, and just like some major words to know. Uh, also, it's like it comes down to you being prepared in class and you kind of getting these words because a lot of these words come from your AP World History curriculum. Like me, myself, I saw on PowerPoints multiple times contemporaneous, contemporary, artillery. And that just comes down to you looking at the PowerPoint. Um, but, you know, also for any all students out here, uh, look, look at those lists to kind of get a brief overview of it. And Skylar's posting it below. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm looking for it now. Okay. So if you all have any more questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, we're here for you guys, so. So Mr. Little said, how many paragraphs should I write for a DBQ? Um, 
so me personally, I would recommend, let's see, three, four, I would recommend six paragraphs just um, as a basic outline because the DBQ, it does require a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it requires some contextualization, you know, what was going on during that period. And then it requires some introduction to the overall concept, your overall thesis. And then I would recommend kind of grouping the paragraphs into three distinct points that you have to base your argument off of. And then um, creating an extra paragraph for conclusion and an external source analysis. Um, so that's what I would recommend, just six paragraphs for it. They don't have to be very long paragraphs, but it's just six distinct paragraphs based on the overall, uh, you know, guidelines for DBQs. And that's what I did last year um, and my recommendation. Anything else, Skylar? Well, I know for me personally, um, I'm a really fast writer. So I finished my DBQ in like 20 minutes and I was like, well, I have all this extra time. Like, how can I help refine my answer? So I originally had a six paragraph layout and then I added a seventh paragraph. And in the seventh paragraph, I was like, okay, you know, I'm not sure how good my, my external source was. So I just added an extra paragraph just in case uh, about an external source. And I think that sort of helped me out just as like fallback information. Yeah, I did the same exact thing, actually. Um, I literally, like, I finished in, like, 30 minutes, so I was like, I mean, I have extra time. If my external source is not good enough, I'm going to add some more extra info about that source. So I ended up going in and, like, writing a date for the actual thing and when the event happened, which, including some extra information, like, that's always beneficial. Um, but, yeah, as a fallback. All right, so any other questions from you guys? No, we're, we're glad to help. Just make sure to reach out to us. Because most of y'all did say that it's a hard course, so um, just ask us any questions about you know, how to improve in it or just what you're having trouble with. All right, so we'll stay here for two more minutes and let you guys um, field questions. I'm going to try looking for that link because I used it well last year. I had the exact same question as um, Melissa, Melissa Longnecker about this because I was I would go through and do practice tests and I'd be like, I don't know what three quarters of these words are. And I had a helpful resource that I used last year. Wait, I'm going to check again. Um, so I'm just going to look for that. Oh, I found a big list of history words. So I think this can help you guys out a lot. I think I used this one last year from Alpha History. Um, I'll link it in here. I mean, it's just a bunch of history words that y'all need to know. And I will recommend uh, for, for us here at Favable, we have a creator team. So, I mean, if we're able to create a list like this, Skylar, later on, um, this yeah, should really help you guys great. out. Here's a link for the Alpha History one for now. Um, and we can help you guys out by creating one for the blog in a few weeks here. But here's a baseline. So if you guys do want to go to that link, I mean, something great for you guys to use. Yes, Ms. Longnecker, it's a very, very thorough list. I mean, it has a lot of words for you guys to know. And if you do want to, like, make it into, you know, I can review two words a day and just, you know, review other words and other just two words a day for a whole month or so. You should usually get it down, um, down pat. So it can also help you guys, especially with these DBQs, LEQs, SAQs. Wording is like very, very important because uh, when you word things in a specific manner, the AP graders are going to give you more points for it. Um, that's what my teacher said at least. So like if you're able to word things and put in words like aristocracy, um, like, you know, communism, democracy, some of these keywords like that, more specific, it can help you guys get a better score. All right. So if you guys have, if you guys don't have any more questions, we can go ahead and end the stream here today. Um, Quick plug to Fiveable, follow Think Fiveable, subscribe to Think Fiveable on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, and then also my Instagram and Twitter. Um, uh, it's at Varun Kadathala. And oh, Scholar okay. has hers there uh, as well. Yeah, we have a question from Sunny in the DBQ slash LEQ. Does the contextualization become come before or after the thesis? I think that depends a lot on your teacher. Um, like, okay, I independent studied it, so I didn't really have a teacher. Um, but I went to the AP US teacher, and he told me to 
put it beforehand. Um, so that's what I did on the test, but I don't know if everyone does that. I completely agree. Like the best people that I've used, like Steve Heimler and these experts uh, per se um, in DBQs and also a bunch of people at Five Bull I learned off of, they all said the same thing. And it was to put the contextualization before the thesis because it would kind of muddle your argument if you put the contextualization after the thesis. And I wouldn't ever do that just for a background basis because once you put your thesis out there, you want to kind of back up that thesis and not just like divert from the thesis entirely and go back into the contextualization. So it's kind of like making the story. Um, so you guys kind of get what I mean. Contextualization, setting up the basis for the thesis, um, and then the thesis coming in and saying what you're going to review, and then going in on the basics of the thesis, and then concluding the whole thing and creating like an external source at the very end. So that's the, you know, that's the basis of it. And Mr. Diorto, Mrs. Longnecker, who are also teachers here with Fiveable, um, also believe so. So, Sonny, I hope that answers your question. And Mackenzie just said, putting it before gives the information your reader needs to understand your thesis. Exactly. That's a great response. No problem. All right. So any other questions, you guys, before we end the stream today? Feel free to ask them. <laughs> and we have a good way to remember it. Um, you're setting up the reader for the thesis. It is the same as scrolling yellow words in a Star Wars movie before the action begins. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and we have another comment uh, from Dawn At Atwell. Uh, it is also strong to end your first paragraph with your thesis to make it clear to your reader. Yeah, I mean, everyone seems to uh, be agreeing here. I think that's very important because uh, you want to have all this context and then just like not have a thesis at the very end because that's what I would recommend, just putting a thesis at the very, very end and then immediately after that thesis going into the evidence and things like that. <laughs> Mr. Giorto again said, which is a very good example. I mean, if you guys want to look off of it, but you know, you can't watch a Star Wars movie without that contextualization and just knowing what the background is. And, you know, it applies to anything. Like you can't go into some random um, you know, some random AP World History session without knowing any context behind it. Um, like you have to know a little bit of context. So yeah, um, uh, thank you guys all for joining. Uh, we're very glad to be here, be able to share our knowledge with you guys here today. Um, and yeah, thank you so much.